All right, thank you everyone for doing that. So what we have this morning for you, for those of you who are first timers, we've got kind of a, a three part session. First up will be uh, Dr. Marty Chilvers. He's our MSU field crop plant pathologist, and he'll be focusing today on wheat diseases, head scab and other diseases. Uh, and we will switch and we'll hear an update on uh, weather from our state climatologist, Dr. Jeff Andreessen. <clears throat> then we'll take care of credits for those of you who need to get back into the tractor. And then we'll have a, an extended Q&A session and that'll take us up till eight o'clock. So first up is Marty. Marty, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me on this morning. All right. So what I thought um, I'd do this morning is certainly cover head scab, but also touch on some other foliar diseases and then um, some of the um, impacts on yield from fungicide applications and, and various fungicide timings. So just really quick, <clears throat> quick overview, a reminder of some of those other um, foliar diseases of wheat that can certainly um, rob us of yield potential. We had quite a bit of powdery mildew last year. There's a little bit out there this year, uh, a little bit of septoria leaf spot as well at the moment. Uh, we aren't seeing any of the rusts as of yet. Um, so last year we had very dry conditions, right? We had all these sort of ideal planting conditions at the start of the season. And that really did help drive this explosion of powdery mildew. So powdery mildew certainly does uh, prefer those, uh, the lack of rainfall. So it's one of those sort of rare diseases that sort of has that preference. And so that's why we had a pretty massive explosion of that last year. Um, we are seeing a little bit um, this year, but not a terrible amount uh, as compared to last year due to the environment that we had. Um, just another one to mention that has been very problematic in the past was striped rust. I think it was back in 2016 and maybe 17 as well. Um, it doesn't appear to be on a trajectory for, um, you know, for any major devastation this year. Um, typically, you know, we, we look for striped rust in our sort of southern um, states and then you know, look for movement of that north. And as of yesterday, you know, there hasn't been that many reports. I'm also watching Twitter feeds of various other um, people around the country. So I, I, th I think we'll probably be okay. And our later applications, probably our head scab applications, will probably provide us protection from um, stripe rust by the time it arrives uh, here in Michigan this, this coming season. All right, so let's start talking about head scab management. Um, head scab risk, of course, is heavily dependent on the weather. So it'll be interesting to see what the, um, the outlook here is from Jeff in a minute. Um, variety selection is critical. If you've been struggling with head scab in the past, you know, you really should be talking to your seed dealer about trying to look for a different variety because that's one of the very key um, elements of any disease management really is looking for a variety with better resistance. We're going to talk about fungicide timing, fungicide choice, and then um, coverage of that head, making sure we get that fungicide product actually where it needs to be for management of that head scab pathogen. So just a quick reminder then, you know, what is Fusarium head blight? Um, so it's caused by this fungal pathogen, Fusarium graminearum, um, and that survives in... Um, corn residue very well, it will survive in wheat residue. And we certainly find it on soybean roots and dry bean roots. So it's, it's got a very sort of broad host range, but it, it does its primary damage in both corn and wheat. So, you know, planting wheat into corn is a bit of a no-no uh, just because we do have a lot more inoculum potential um, from that corn residue. So just something to be mindful of. It produces a bunch of these uh, parathesia or um, fruiting bodies on corn residue and then releases spores from that. And there's a couple of different spore types that can be released um, and then um, move up to the head and infect um, the, uh, the flower. Um, and then of course, identification, it's one of those relatively easy diseases to identify. Um, especially when we're at, you know, getting close to that, that ripening of, of the wheat heads here. Um, you know, you'll see obviously those dead, dead 
um, parts of the spike there uh, indicating is most likely fusarium. And then other indicators include like an orange or pinkish um, ooze coming from those. And that's just that, that fusarium making more reproductive um, spores. Um, and in terms of the conditions then, so warm, wet weather during flowering. So that's something we'll be watching for. Um, I did pull up the wheat head scab model um, yesterday, and this is what it was showing us. Uh, of course, we, you know, we've still got a little bit of time before actually flowering um, and heading, but at the moment, the risk model is putting us at low risk. And you can see parts of Iowa here at, at very high risk for head scab. So this is a model if, if you are on the fence about a fungicide application, um, you could certainly use this to get a sense of, you know, what is my risk? And you can play around with um, going back in time and going forward up to six days in time to see the, the potential risk for head scab development. And it's been, been pretty accurate. Um, so days from heading to flowering, just a quick reminder, this does happen pretty quickly, right? So once, once we have head emergence, it, we're only about you know, two to four days um, before we see the beginning of flowering occurring. So everything does sort of happen pretty quickly once we start to get um, into that boot stage and then with head emergence. Head scab fungicide timing is absolutely critical um, if we want to maximize control. So really the ideal timing is when we are in those sort of that first week of flowering. Um, so on a wheat head, flowering will typically start in the middle of the head. It will move to the top and then to the bottom of that, that wheat head. And what do we mean by the beginning of flowering? Well, in a field, what we are looking for is 50% or more of their heads are flowering. Of course, we can have variability if we have a variability in the field, topography, soil types, you know, stresses that can certainly affect the timing of various parts of that field. But, you know, the, the research that we've done to try and look at, you know, what is the, the window of control here? Um, it's around about a week um, from that beginning of flowering. So we see optimal control from that beginning of flowering to seven days um, from that beginning of flowering. And this, there's a little bit of optimization. If you had the ability to wait and the weather was going to be okay, we'd probably wait, you know, until we're just a day or two after this beginning of flowering, probably about two to four days post uh, beginning of flowering appears to be somewhat more optimal, but that, that's fairly minor, um, especially if you need to get across a lot of acres. So what about um, fungicides for head scab management. So we've got um, more choices that have come to market very recently. So for a long time, um, you know, Follicure and Tilt were a couple of products that, that we used um, and they're available in generic forms as well. And Prosaro and Carumba and then Miravis Ace came to market about six years ago or so now. Um, and that's had, you know, quite good performance as well. But then more recently, um, we've had Spherex and then Prosaro Pro. Um, so what I've put up here is the efficacy ratings. And this is from data and conversation from us here at Michigan State, but also uh, a number of universities that participate in the wheat disease discussion group. Um, so we'll go through and we'll make um, rankings of these products, basically, you know, from fair, poor or good depending on how we see them uh, performing. These couple of newer products, I've, I've just put in parentheses for now, just because you know, they're, they're, they're newer and we don't have as much data, um, but let me share some data that we do have. Um, and just the other thing I'd point out as well is um, the active ingredients in these various products. Um, so what is exciting about some of these other products is that now we also have some other um, modes of action that are um, in that product. So that's, that could be good for fungicide resistance management. We've done quite a bit of work looking at fungicide resistance management and so far, um, or fungicide resistance development. And so far we haven't seen any um, great cause for concern in the head scab pathogen, but it's something we certainly wanna be vigilant of because we, we certainly don't wanna lose these products. And there is certainly a heavy reliance on these group three, those uh, DMI, um, type products. 
Um, so here's some data that was pulled together from Michigan and, and other um, states here from my colleague Pierce at Ohio State. Um, and this is looking, this includes Ferex in there, one of those newer products. So we've got a check here and this left graphic is what we're looking at the amount of head scab. So go out and visually rate um, plots for how much head scab is appearing. So obviously in this check plot, we've got quite a bit of head scab. Prasaro, uh, Karamba did a great job in reducing that, you know, dropping that by, I don't know, about 60 plus percent. Miravis Ace performing perhaps a little bit better. And then Spherex was doing a pretty reasonable job as well. Um, in terms of visual disease. And then the amount of mycotoxin or deoxynivalanil DON, um, again, we're seeing around about a 50% reduction from, from these various products, Prasara, Karamba, Miravis Ace, um, and Spherix was doing quite a good job um, at suppressing DON too, which was really nice to see. So just more options than what we had um, a few years ago, that's for sure. Um, and we're continuing evaluating uh, these products as, as things come to market and things change. Um, this is a slide that um, Dave Hooker and colleagues have put together previously. Um, so typically when we're thinking about fungicide applications and when we do most of our applications, you know, be it for tar spot, um, or white mold and other things, we're just using a flat fan or foliar diseases, a flat fan pointed straight down. Um, that's fine for foliar diseases. We get pretty good coverage of the foliage, um, but it's not really that good for maximizing coverage of that wheat head. Painted onto that wheat head as possible. So there are a couple of different things that can be done. Um, and these are a couple of suggestions that, that David made a few years ago now, either having a, a back and forward um, turbo T jet in, in this top picture example, or alternating turbo flood jet in this bottom example. Um, North Dakota State University also has some literature out there um, suggesting the use of flat fan nozzles, but angled forward, um, ideally about 30 degrees. So as we're coming across that head, we get a, a pretty good coverage of that, that wheat head as we drive through the field. Um, and we certainly don't want to skimp on water. Um, most of our applications are done at 15 gallons per acre. Um, I believe the 10 gallons per acre is still okay, but we, you know, as we start dropping off that we may potentially, you know, lose some efficacy there again, because it's about getting that product um, onto the head. Okay, so just in terms of integrated head scab management, then um, we've already talked about this, but again, resistant variety is critical. Fungicide application from flowering up to about six or seven days post the beginning of flowering. And what we certainly don't want to use is any fungicides, including a QOI, um, strobilurin chemistry, um, from the boot stage on, because that can actually drive up the amount of microtoxin or deoxynivalanol don. It's counterintuitive, but there's plenty of evidence to show that those strobilurins can potentially do that. Um, and nothing is labeled um, in terms of fungicide products, you know, that, that you shouldn't be using that, that include those strobilurins anyway. So if you're following the label, you should be okay. Ensure good coverage of the head that we just talked about. And crop rotation, right, avoid planting in the corn. We also want to try and manage for uniformity. Um, if we can, of course, it's going to be a lot more difficult if we've got um, fields that are uneven in maturity due to differences in fertility or other plant stresses that we might be able to, um, you know, reduce or mitigate. Um, and then again, just a reminder, um, don't rely on just one technique. We really want to try and integrate um, all of these techniques that we've talked about really, but certainly variety res and resistance and fungicide application together um, ha have the best performance in, in terms of managing and suppressing um, mycotoxin accumulation and, and head scab development. Okay, so now I just want to um, chat about fungicide timing and the impact on yield. So we've had this question for a number of years and, and we certainly have different data sets, but we pulled together uh, a number of different data sets to have a look at this um, over many years and different trials and locations as to like, what is the actual benefit? We know a lot of people tank mix a fungicide at what we might call the T1, right? The first timing at fixed six growth stage. Um, flag leaf is also a critical growth stage. And back when we had that stripe rust epidemic, we actually really needed that 
that flag leaf protection was really important to have a fungicide on at that time. So that fix nine, once that flag leaf is fully emerged or as it's you know completing its emergence in that stage before. And then of course, you know, T3, that timing three is the head scab timing. Um, very often we may not need that, that flag leaf application because we do get quite a bit of a yield um, protection from that T3 application timing um, at, at heading. Um, of course, you know, we're putting those fungicides on, um, you know, to help manage mycotoxins, but we also do get product onto the foliage and that does help to protect that flag leaf as well. Anyway, so what we did, and this was uh, done by a graduate student in the lab, uh, a meta-analysis using a whole bunch of different studies that we had out, um, pulling data um, from our lab, Kurt Steinke's lab and Martin Nagelkirk, um, who's done many years of trials up in the thumb. So this is a, a yield response compared to the non-treated check. And you can see that the majority of the responses are positive. We have a few that, are, that were negative trending in terms of yield. Um, and what I have here is the different timings, the T1 um, combinations as well, T1 plus T3, et cetera, um, color coded out. Well, let's just look at the means. This is, you know, this is all well and good, but this is what we saw in terms of the actual yield response from those fungicide applications. So again, the single application at that, around about that fixed six growth stage, on average, we were seeing a four bushel response, which personally I was, I was somewhat surprised by the, the size of that response. Um, you can do the math for yourself, right? In terms of how much, um, how much fungicide that the cost is and then you know, yield return um, in current. Uh, grain prices, of course. The T2, again, just a reminder, that was the flag leaf application. We saw nearly seven bushels from that as a single application. And then that T3 application, as I was talking about, sometimes we can wait until the T3. We saw nearly seven and a half bushel from a single application at that head scab um, timing. In terms of um, double applications, a T1, so a fix six plus, um, a head scab or a flowering timing, we saw about 10 and a half bushel. And then a T2, so that flag leaf, followed by that head scab application, we saw about nine and a half bushel. So we're working with Kurt Steinke at the moment to actually look at you know, the three-way, so a, a T1, T2, and T3 application. And we've got a couple of different management systems, an irrigated and a dry land system to look at that, um, which we're pretty excited about and different fertility treatments too, which, which will be very interesting. So certainly on average, all ap application timings provide a significant yield benefit. Um, obviously the flag leaf and the head scab timings on their own provide a greater yield um, benefit than that, that early fungicide application. I do need to really stress that responses are gonna vary. You are not gonna see this response per se on your farm in your field, right? You might. This is an average of responses. Um, and this is why I really think it's important to try and leave check strips um, if possible um, to get a sense of, you know, what is my return on investment from these various um, products that we're using. Um, and just a final note too, if we are using, putting fungicides out more times during the season, that certainly does put additional risk um, in terms of fungicide resistance development. So that, that's a downside to additional fungicide applications that we can't ignore. I, I just thought it was very interesting, these yield responses that we were seeing, and I'd be happy to discuss those further. So with that, I'll leave it at that. So for those of you who are joining via phone up on the screen right now, we've got uh, some other ways for all of our attendees to be able to access the presentation recordings. Uh, that's via our our field crops web page. We've also on Twitter and Spotify podcasts on Apple, as well as Facebook. So this is where we shift gears, move into our time of Q&A. And we do have a couple of questions already, but everyone feel free to go ahead and type in any questions that you've got into the chat box. Our first two questions are for Marty. Uh, first one, Marty. Uh, there's more and more cereal rye used as cover crop. Is there any incidence of ergot in this area, especially if it goes to maturity with all of our inability to terminate the crop this year? 
Um, yeah, that certainly could be a, a concern. Um, so ergot, um, you know, produces these alkaloids and it's, there's a lot of European history around this too, right? Um, but yes, that certainly could, you know, potentially increase the inoculum potential for ergot. And here's some examples or a photo of ergot affecting a wheat head here. Um, so this fungal disease basically um, replaces that um, ovary um, seed um, tissue in that, that wheat head. So that's certainly of concern if we have additional um, grass species out there that, that could become infected too. Uh, I'll just take a quick second as well, just to point out some other things we'd be looking for um, as we go into maturity as well. There has been some dwarf bunt and common bunt or stinking smut. Um, these are very problematic. Um, this is also fungal. It's a different sort of group of fungi, but it's also fungal. And it produces a, a, a fishy smell in the grain. And so that's why it's a problem. Um, it can get loads rejected because of this. Um, so we had some reports over the last couple of years. Um, it, it could be increasing somewhat. Um, if you happen to see this, we would very much appreciate samples um, so that we can um, just sort of document what's going on. And we're, we're working on some projects here, trying to figure out exactly which species is there causing the problems. So, Okay. Another question. <clears throat> Uh, which wheat diseases, uh, particularly the ones in the lower canopy, which should we be on the lookout for given the, the six to 10 day outlook that Jeff just gave us? Yeah. Um, so, you know, any moisture events, if you're getting those, um, you know, septoria, stagonospora, those, those leaf diseases that we talked about earlier might begin climbing up the canopy. Um, I've, you know, we saw Sep septoria has been there, you know, almost from the start. Um, at low levels, if we get frequent, you know, if we do get any more frequent rainfall events, and that's going to just help drive that up the canopy. Um, as we talked about too, some of those really aggressive things like stripe rust it don't really seem to be in the picture at the moment, so that's good. Um, so that that's of yeah less of a concern. So some of those endemic things like septoria. So going back to this issue of uh, maybe some crossover uh, from cereal rye. Uh, what are some of those diseases that, that could spread from a cereal rye cover crop over into a wheat field? And then maybe how far uh, would that spread, like from one field to the next, a quarter right. mile, how far? Uh, so it's going to, yeah, it's really going to depend on the disease that we're concerned about. I, I think in general, there's not you know, widespread concern of cereal rye creating issues for wheat crops um, that, Ergot we just talked about does actually produce a like a honeydew phase that attracts insects, and so you could, could get some insect vectoring of that. But um, I don't think that's particularly well. Anyway, that that's a potential, I guess. Um, in general, I don't think it's a major issue. I think the the cover crop potential outweighs um, any you know potential disease impact or cover crop okay. benefits. Yeah. And as far as timing for fungicide sprays, uh, uh, for us down here in the Southwest, we're, we're definitely at jointing, maybe even got a second joint on uh, some of the fields. Um, so we're past T1. Um, mm -hmm. What are we looking at for timings for our, our wheat? And does it depend on when it got planted in the fall? Yeah, I mean, that will affect timing for sure. Um, so really what I would be looking at now um, if we're past that, that FIC six application timing is, and someone had asked, you know, privately in the questions too about um, the importance of that flag leaf. Um, and it does contribute a lot to yield, you know, somewhere in the order of 60 to 70% of yield potential. Um, so it's important to have a, a flag leaf that's, you know, relatively clean. Um, as we talked about as well, you know, if we are putting a fungicide applica application on um, at, flowering that typically does provide protection of that flag leaf unless we're in a situation where we've got something like stripe rust um, you know that we may need to get in earlier before that flowering application just because that's a very very aggressive disease um, so yeah the next real sort of opportunity there I guess is flag leaf if we wanted to make a flag leaf application 
But if we're also concerned about HeadsGab, they're going to have to come back, you know, a week or two later anyway to make that HeadsGab application. So yeah, while we're waiting for folks to, to ask more questions, uh, uh, do we have any other specialists on this morning who, who have an update? Can't Eric, see my... Eric, this is Dennis Pennington. Um, one thing about the early versus late planted wheat, it seems like this year the difference in, in development like physiological development is much more pronounced. Normally, when you, once you get to feet six and seven, um, those differences in growth stages from the early versus late planted wheat starts to go away. But there is a big difference this year between early and planted. So when you're managing, you know, what Marty said about the timing for your growth stages is still accurate, but you may have fields in much more, a, a much larger range of differences in physiological um, you know, development. So it might be really, you know, normally you would go out there and decide, all right, I'm going to put head scab fungicide on and you just do all your acres. Um, if you have some late planted wheat and early planted wheat, you might have to come back and, and do your, your uh, late planted wheat, you know, at a different timing. Um, so just keep that sure you're timing the application properly. And by the way, uh, for, for those of you who are on this morning, feel free if you've got questions uh, for other specialists. Uh, if they're on this morning, uh, we can certainly direct them to them. So it doesn't have to be just about uh, diseases on wheat. Uh, any other specialists on who have any, any comments, any, any insect issues? Uh, I think I saw Chris on earlier. I'm here. Um, my uh, trap counts have been very low. I think Eric, yours have been low too for black cutworm and for true armyworm, like no armyworms at all. And uh, like I'm getting one black cutworm a week, but I did see that there was a trap up in the thumb. I don't know whose trap that that is that had something like 30 last week, which would be um, a, a heavy catch and driving around, man, there's a lot of uh, chickweed and uh, dead nettle and all sorts of annual weeds there. And um, I was doing some, some grub sampling down in Bowling Green last week. And as we were pulling up weeds, looking for grubs, we found a couple of black cutworm, you know, pretty easily that was down there. So if there's, uh, if, if those annual weeds are there and they're not dead yet, and uh, those females come in and, and, and lay eggs. And then once those weeds are sprayed out, then they will move to the corn crop afterwards. So it's something to really be to, to be watching for and to be very careful about if you don't have good weed, weed control yet in some of those fields. Although, like, like I said, my counts have been very low and Eric, your counts have been very low too in the Southern part of Michigan. I think, you know, it's all could be luck of the draw on where a storm front comes through and things kind of rain out. And there's a lot of grubs, I just, I'm just saying. And I guess my, my, my last thing, and this all has to do with that we don't have winter anymore. There's going to be mosquitoes in a few weeks that there's just going to be a lot of them. But I also already have ticks. And I've never, I mean, again, I know we're all in agriculture and we, we think we're not traipsing through the woods. But when you're on the edge of a field and you're loading seed or something and you're going through that ditch and there's tall vegetation, southern Michigan up into mid, mid, mid Michigan, the tick burden is very large and it is growing. And I just was out yesterday mowing at the entomology farm on campus and I went home and I had ticks on me. So without winter, ticks survive very well and deer and rodents move them around. And just at the end of the day, check yourself for ticks if you've walked through any taller vegetation on the edge of a field. Eric, I'm, I uh, have been walking some alfalfa fields that had extensive water last year. And in those fields, I'm seeing several places where we have uh, sheeting that took place during the wintertime, where we had excessive uh, water that laid on the field and has killed the low spots. And I've also seen several areas, especially on the clay soils where we have heaving of alfalfa. Uh, I've seen it up a half to three quarters to maybe an inch at times, uh, along with excessive winter kill. 
but it really wasn't winter kill because most of the alfalfa probably died last year due to the excessive water during the summer and the fall. So we're seeing alfalfa fields that if they're not greened up by now, even if you're on tiled fields, uh, you should make plans to uh, do something with that alfalfa because it's not <laughs> going to come back. And even if it does grow some by the time, the summer gets here and your cutting schedule is uh, on track, you're going to see that that alfalfa will die. So uh, take note of that. And if you need alfalfa and it's something that uh, you're not prepared to uh, lose a field, you better plan on planting some, maybe take a first cutting and then go to corn and take advantage of the nitrogen that's going to be available in that field. So just an FYI for our alfalfa grower, for our alfalfa, growers. So Phil, what's the best recommendation for alfalfa fields or an alfalfa grass mix that has uh, these low spots either drowned out or frozen out? Well, if, um, if the no, field has, if the field has uh, just areas or pockets of areas, many times you can go in and ho hopefully no-till some grass into those areas and it will help to fill that in and still provide some yield. Now, the grass choices, there are several that you can use. It really depends on what you prefer. Some people have used uh, orchard grass. Some people have used an Italian rye. Some people have used different kinds of grasses. But it, if you want to put some in there, uh, I would go ahead and no-till a grass into that field because you don't want to put alfalfa into an alfalfa field because of autotoxicity. All right. We're not seeing any other questions in the chat. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thanks, everyone, again, for joining us this morning. We'll look forward to seeing you back here next week with Dr. Kurt Steinke. Have a good day.